Hello and welcome everybody to another one of these things and Happy New Year! I'm sorry it's taken so long to get this one out to you guys. I seem to be apologizing for that quite often. I've got a bit of an excuse this time. I got sick with the you know what? Yeah, I finally got it after all this time not getting it and I did. Thankfully I kicked that before the holidays and they went well. Hopefully your holidays went well as well. <laughs> And uh, anyway, this one is a little bit about the human condition. How we ask for things, we get them, and then decide uh, we didn't want them in the first place. And myself, well, I'm guilty of this because when I buy a lens, I go out there pouring over DxO mark scores, trying to find the sharpest lens I can for my camera. And then I decide I don't want things to look that sharp. I don't want things to look so, um, I mean, digitally sharp, I guess is what people call them, but they're just, um, modern lenses can be incredibly sharp. And not only that, uh, they exhibit very few imperfections. And of course, some people feel that uh, they lack character. Now you could be working on something where uh, that's, exactly what you're after, especially if you're doing product work and you want to represent a product um, exactly how it looks in real life. You don't want to get too stylized with it, obscure what something actually looks like. So in that case, you know, having something um, like the lens I'm shooting now, uh, shooting this with now, the, the 35 1.8 from Sony, super sharp lens, great for product stuff because you're getting uh, exactly what uh, everything looks like. Now, uh, people sometimes go the vintage lens route to give their images a little bit more character and maybe knock a little bit of that sharpness off. That's super cool. A uh, couple lenses that I'm going to be covering in this one are, um, well, have become pretty popular. They're um, two uh, Russian lenses. Uh, one of them is a uh, Indistar and the other is a Helios, and uh, the Helios has become super, super popular. They even used it in one of the Batman films. Uh, not extensively, it was for a very short scene, and it looks nothing like a Helios that you might buy on the used market, because it was repacked. And um, what I mean by repacked is they basically put it in a completely different uh, barrel um, so it would work with focus pullers and things like that. Anyway, knocking the sharpness off your image. Now the advantages of using filters on a modern lens is you can control things like how much you knock back your sharpness or the amount that you're taking away from light contrast or something like that. Uh, whereas with a vintage lens, you're sort of stuck with what you have as far as those things go. Something you do achieve sometimes with a vintage lens is maybe some uh, bokeh that has some character to it. Uh, like the Helios has got these uh, sort of swirls in the, in the bokeh and uh, you could get maybe like a cat's eye effect or whatever in the bokeh, which is something that, you know, a lot of people don't like and you don't see so often with new lenses. And uh, some people like it just for the sake of character. Or there may be some flaring and things like that that you don't necessarily get with the coatings you find on modern lenses. And that kind of stuff is also more prevalent on vintage lenses. So uh, the two vintage lenses I will touch on, I will touch on a couple of vintage lenses. Plus I'm going to give you some examples of using the Black Pro Mist 1 quarter, which is the one I'm shooting with right now and the Black Pro Mist 1 8 uh, and I'm, I'll throw that one on as well. And then there's the Glimmer Glass 3. Those of you who watched episodes in the past know that I was experimenting with Glimmer Glass 3. The Glimmer Glass comes in a different variety of strengths. I even think it goes down to uh, fractional uh, strengths. I've got the Glimmer Glass 3, which is a little heavy-handed. I had mentioned a little bit heavy-handed in the video I did uh, in the past with the Glimmer Glass, especially because I used it outside, which was really uh, blowing things out a little too much. I was actually uh, losing a lot of uh, what I wanted to capture using the Glimmer Glass 3. I didn't really realize that until I got back into the uh, studio here and started looking at things on my monitors but um, indoors it wasn't too bad because these lights aren't pointing directly into the camera or anything like that. My lighting as far as what's behind me is pretty subtle. 
So uh, it did give sort of a nice sort of look, but it also gave me maybe a little bit too much of that 80s soap opera look that I was trying to avoid. And um, you know, that was some, something, you know, back in the day, uh, and, and I'm old enough to remember this time, where we used to do some pretty crazy stuff to give us that look. It was something that we wanted. There was a company called Glamour Shots, and apparently they're still around doing the same sort of crappy portraits that they did back in the 80s. Uh, they're not quite as over the top as they were back then. Basically, it was like you'd go in for a makeover. It was something that was really um, popular at one time, especially uh, family uh, portraits and stuff like that. But um, it was usually someone who wanted to go in to do these uh, glamour portraits. They do like a makeover, the whole deal, and then uh, the photographs would be done with this crazy uh, diffusion that would give you that sort of dream sequence look that you'd see in a movie or the that you'd see in close-ups on, on a soap opera, for instance. And uh, this was something actually that we used to accomplish in photography class with Vaseline and a UV filter. <laughs> We'd actually like scoop Vaseline <laughs> out of the jar and put it on the um, on a UV filter and uh, it worked. I mean you know it wasn't really consistent uh, you know from one day to the next if you had to do this again because you'd have to get like that coating of Vaseline the same every time but it was one of those tricks that we would use if we didn't have a filter specifically designed to do this and there were all kinds of like wacky tricks like that that um, the people used to use so a glimmer glass 3 is actually pretty strong because I could have went with a 2-1 or those fractional ones. It did look a little soap opera-ish. It was it was probably a, a little bit too strong for my taste, but but not too bad. Um, I'd consider using it uh, for interiors again, but outside, uh, not likely. The Black Promise filters have become very popular amongst the YouTube crowd and not just the Black Promise but also the Cinebloom uh, filters from Moment as well as uh, KNF Concept also has their more affordable versions of the uh, Black Promise uh, as well. And I haven't had a chance to test those although I am a bit of a uh, KNF Concept fan. As some of you may know I've used a lot of their NDs on both uh, my drone and uh, my camera, my regular camera. Now uh, about the vintage lenses I'm going to cover, I just got this one in from Kiev of all places yesterday. I didn't want the um, terrible stuff going on over there to deter me from buying from somebody in the Ukraine. I figured they could probably use the sale. And um, this is in fantastic condition, in mint condition in fact. Uh, so much so, I wonder if I'm going to get any halation or any real diffusion from this at all. Uh, because this lens is so clean. One thing I know I can count on is the uh, the interesting bokeh that's going to come from this lens. I have owned another Helios, unfortunately it uh, was not what I was after. It was the one that's on the different uh, mount actually and um, quite different as far as um, its condition as well compared to this. It was uh, in pretty horrible shape. I uh, decided to hold on to that lens anyway because it was in the polished metal uh, barrel which is gorgeous. Now the Helios is a 58mm f2.0 and the other lens I wanted to talk about is this. This is an Indistar and the Indistar is also a Russian lens and it is a 53mm 2.8. So this is a little bit slower and it's not in the same condition as the Helios. Uh, this has definitely uh, seen better days. It's uh, a little dirty inside, hasn't been cleaned, but I don't want to touch it because uh, I'm buying these lenses for a little bit of character. Perhaps I shouldn't have bought a Helios that was in such good condition actually. <laughs> 
But um, I'm really interested to see what this shot, the talking head shot, would look like through this. Anyways, on to some examples. Um, actually, you're seeing an example right now. I'm shooting this using a black Promist one quarter. And uh, I'll be switching it out soon for the 1 8 the Glimmer Glass 3, then we're gonna do the Indostar, we're gonna do the Helios, and then we're also going to do a little bit of the diffusion and halation in post. Doing this in post has the advantage that you're not baking the way things look right into your shot like you are with a filter. It's got uh, its cons as well too. Some people may feel it's not as authentic a, a, a look uh, because you're not doing it in camera. Uh, I myself personally know that a lot of these um, post effects have come a long way and you may not see the difference. Anyway, that's what we're here to find out. So, on with the test. So those of you who've been to my channel before, you know I don't do anything scientifically. This is just to give you some sort of frame of reference as to what you can expect if you decide to buy one of these filters, lenses, or do things in post. Um, anyway, so what I should give you first is a control. A control being um, an image like this that has nothing on the lens. So right now we're not doing anything to increase the halation or to knock back the sharpness. So here we are working with full sharpness. Hopefully you can see my skin really nice and you're going to be able to compare uh, this to sort of what happens uh, when we um, take this through the various sort of uh, stages of filters, then the lenses, and then the post. Anyway, what I've got here behind me, that little light, is an Aperture Amaran. I threw a little bit of a warming filter on there just to make it look a little nicer. Uh, it looks a bit dull, just white, so <laughs> I thought I'd make it look a little nicer with the uh, uh, a little warming gel on there, a uh, yellow gel. Now, um, you're not really seeing the color on it right now. That's one of those things that you can see a lot better once I put the Black Promist on, for instance. Uh, because it does uh, actually knock back a little bit of the exposure. The black Promist actually does have sort of black little specks in it and it so it does knock back your exposure a little bit and that's one of the reasons you're not actually seeing the color in that light because when I set that light up I set it up with the black Promist uh, one quarter on there and that's the one I'm putting on first. First you're gonna see the one quarter go on uh, actually, I'll reach out and uh, put it on right now. So immediately you can see a difference. There's a ton of halation going on around that light and the exposure has dropped enough that you can see the color in it as well. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through all these step by step and then I'm gonna give you the side by side so you can see them all uh, beside each other. Uh, hopefully I can fit them all in the same frame. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Anyway, all right, uh, now uh, now this was the Tiffin Pro Mist one quarter, and now we're going to the one eighth. This is the Tiffin Black Pro Mist one eighth. And this is the Tiffin Glimmer Glass 3. This is the Indostar 53mm 2.8 at f2.8. I really hope I'm in focus. It's a little bit difficult to tell at this distance, but this is the famous Helios 58mm 2.0 at f2.0. And this is the control image with the post work done in DaVinci Resolve trying to emulate Tiffin Pro Mist one quarter. Did you notice something different about this setup? Uh, these uh, white studio monitors on both sides, courtesy of um, Ali, uh, Marmar's brother. Uh, he picked those up. For Marmar's my girlfriend, by the way. Uh, he got those for me for Christmas, and I really dig the way they look in the studio here. Those white monitors, really, really nice, and they sound great too. 
And I've also uh, treated myself to another uh, field monitor that's sitting under the camera right now. If you've been watching, you know that my old one uh, died on me, my field world monitor. This one is the uh, five inch port keys monitor, a touch screen monitor, which I really, really like. It's got everything you could imagine in it. Really, really cool. Anyways, uh, I don't know what it is, about these vintage lenses, but I do have a soft spot for them. It could be because I'm sort of getting up in my ears. <laughs> I don't really know what it is, but uh, uh, it is nice to manually focus every once in a while. Of course, I do end up manually focusing on occasion with my autofocus lenses, you know, because there, there are those occasions where you want to put your uh, camera into manual focus. Uh, like if you're shooting through like a fence or something like that, but when you're forced to do it I don't know there's some uh, there's a romance to it anyways Manually focusing and it is a skill of course I might have been out of focus with those tests I'm not really sure I'm gonna have to take a look afterwards once I edit this uh, Anyway, of course, there's a downside uh, having to manually focus um, yeah, uh, It's it's uh, not always convenient and there is a downside of using the vintage lenses aside from that and That's the fact they've got no electronics at all that talk to the camera body so if you're someone like me who likes to use Catalyst Browse to uh, do a bit of stabilization using the gyro data that comes from my camera, I shoot with A7C, so it gives me that gyro data. Unfortunately, uh, the camera has to be able to talk to the lens because the camera needs the focal length that you're shooting with to um, uh, utilize that gyro data. So unfortunately, you're gonna have to rely on whatever post-stabilization or using a gimbal, uh, uh, post-stabilization in your NLE the, uh, without gyro data, uh, or using a gimbal, of course, uh, or just keeping yourself steady. Anyways, if you guys got something out of this, found it entertaining, uh, useful, what have you, please feel free to give me a thumbs up. If not, that's okay too. Uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss any of these, you know, please subscribe. That'd be fantastic. If not, that's all right as well. If you've got any ideas for future shows, please leave those in the comments below. And until next time, please keep working to make your chosen idea a reality. Until next time, peace. <laughs>